Father, bless us as we preach the word of the Lord today in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, men, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic church, Catholic and apostolic church, that is Catholic, the church universal. Not the Catholic organization, but the universal church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This is the Nicene Creed, which was established about the person of Jesus Christ. Three centuries after Christ's ascension, after he ascended into heaven, the church doctrine about the person of Christ had to be established. The emperor Constantine called a council of bishops to Nicaea. Actually, there were two uh, councils. The first was in 325 A.D. and the second in 381 A.D. The Nicene Creed is the Christian statement of faith. In this creed, we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. I read to you in the creed that Jesus was begotten and not created. The word begotten literally means unique. It means he was brought forth. Jesus was never made by anyone. 
Because Jesus is God the Son. Hence the Nicene Creed says, God from God. True God from true God. Isn't that amazing? The doctrine of who Jesus is uh, to the Christian faith was established. Constantine called this council together. There was a man there at this council. His name was Arius, who was teaching a heresy called Arianism, which stated that Jesus Christ was more than a man, but less than God. Also present at this council of bishops at Nicaea was a priest named Nicholas from the port city of Petra, Petra in Asia Minor. This priest named Nicholas was raised by his uncle since he was 10 years old. A plague swept through Patera. And the plague killed his mom and his dad. His uncle raised him. Apparently his uncle uh, did a great job because at, at the age of 19 this young man Nicholas became a priest. He escalated and he moved up quickly because by the time he was 20, he became a bishop. He was the bishop of Myra Lesa near Padera. So we had Arias at this council and we had Bishop Nicholas at the council. Arias in Arianism was teaching that Jesus was more than a mere man, but that he wasn't quite God. Nicholas, who lost his mom and dad when he was 10, became a priest at the age of 19, made bishop by the age of 20, was there also and when he heard Arias uh, attack the divinity of Jesus, he got up and he walked over across the room and he punched Arias in his jaw. Arias left the room running for his life and never came back in. Uh, Nicholas defended the faith. Interestingly enough, this Saint Nicholas is the actual real Nicholas that the mythological uh, hu secularized Santa Claus is named after or based on. If Saint Nicholas, who was a priest, who loved the Lord and became a bishop, if he were alive today, he would be highly offended. He would hit the ceiling. He would be downright angry that over the years, human beings have, without his permission, took his life, his legacy, his faith. God bless you, Brother Bullock. Good to see you, man. His faith in Christ and have used his life and his good deeds uh, to replace the Lord whom he served. People stand in line 
with their children at the mall to sit on Santa's knee. And those children know nothing of Bishop Nicholas. Praise the Lord. They don't know anything about Bishop Nicholas because Bishop Nicholas was saved. And I want to put a plug in while I'm standing for Dillard's. Dillard's, everybody there says Merry Christmas. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Dillard's, go to Dillard's. Dillard's, Dillard's. They didn't ask me to do it. Dillard's, Dillard's, all the rest of them. Season's greetings. I can't stand that. Somebody sent a, a season's greetings card to me. I couldn't believe it. It's 86. It's in the trash can. You don't have to send me a card at Christmas time. But if you send me one, don't send me Caesar's greetings. And don't send me happy holidays. Christians do not celebrate the seasons. Because really, they ain't before. And, and the God of the Bible set them in order. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. Christians do not celebrate the holidays. Christians celebrate the birth of Christ. There is a difference. That's what Christians do. This celebration is a specific one. Ain't nobody going to celebrate the 4th of July talking about thank God for Mother Russia. Would you? If you did, everybody would think you're crazy. But all of a sudden, when it comes to what Nicholas did. And by the way, Nicholas had a friend who was a, uh, I think, a shipping merchant. And his friend fell on hard times. His friend had three daughters. And um, they were really struggling. And there was no hope that the daughters um, would get married in poverty like they were. So the oldest daughter decided that she would um, go into prostitution, sell herself. There was no social security, no welfare, no government handouts, no safety nets. That's the reason they call it the world's oldest profession. And so she wrongly decided to go that way. Nicholas's friend had too much pride to ask for help. And he most certainly, the dad, was not sending the daughter into prostitution. He didn't know. Somehow it got to Bishop Nicholas. For three consecutive nights, the bishop indiscriminately dropped bags of gold down the chimney or placed them where he knew that the merchant would find them. In those days, there were no dryers, so when the ladies washed their stockings. They hung their stockings near the fireplace so that they could dry. On one occasion, some gold, one of the three, fell in the stocking. The merchant was saved. His daughters did not go into prostitution. Bishop Nicholas also was a lover of children. And so uh, he built 
a shop to teach the children how to make a living and how to have toys. So he taught them woodworking and carpentry so that the kids could be kids but also learn a trade that would help them live. Bishop Nicholas would be upset about the North Pole story. Bishop Nicholas would be upset about shimmying down a chimney. He would be upset uh, about the Rudolph story. He never met Prancer, Dancer, Donna and Vixen. <laughs> Look at how we have secularized what Jesus did. Even to the point now that there are those who question whether or not we should even celebrate Christmas at all on December the 25th. You've heard it. You've heard it. Uh, it's the winter solstice. And uh, uh, it's really not Christmas anyway. But many believers, many believe that we celebrate Christmas on December the 20th, 25th because the third century church Christianized, Christianized a date, the date which some pagan festivals were observed. The truth is that the Roman Emperor Aurelian passed an edict in A.D. 247 establishing the winter solstice, that is the birthday of the unconquerable sun. Satalis Solis Invicti, the birthday of the unconquerable son, while he was dedicating the temple. But such notable church fathers as Tertullian and Augustine were convinced that Christmas preceded the pagan holiday. Alvin J. Smith's uh, in his scholarly work under the influence states that in North Africa Christians were already celebrating the birth of Christ on December the 25th in A.D. 243. That is 30 years before Aurelian's edict. 30 years before Aurelian declared the winter solstice. North African Christians were celebrating the birth of Christ on December the 25th. So it is not that the saints tried to Christianize a pagan festival, but it was that the pagans tried to paganize a Christian observer. Like marriage, we owned it first. The government got into marriage. And you know, when the government get into a thing, they mess it up. Now they've redefined the thing. Two men can take a vow. Two women can. But before the government got its filthy hands on it, and that was a filthy, wicked thing, the church owned marriage. So when we celebrate on the 25th, we have a right to celebrate. Alfred Eldersham, one of the foremost scholars on Jewish, ancient Jewish culture and sacred writings, disagree with those who question December the 25th as the date of Christ's birth. He states that there is no adequate reason 
for questioning the historical accuracy of this date. The objections generally made uh, rest on, that they made rest on grounds which seem to me, Alfred said, historically unfeasible. End of quote. We have the right to celebrate. To celebrate what Jesus did and why Jesus came. I hope that everybody here will have a very Merry Christmas. And if you don't, you ought to. Because it ought not to be measured by a gift that you receive. It ought to be measured by a, an appreciation for what Jesus did. Praise the Lord. I didn't get what I wanted for, for Christmas. That ain't all you didn't do. You also weren't born of a virgin. See, there's, there's quite a few aunts that doesn't apply to you. Bless you all. You follow what I'm saying? Let's look at this. The apostle said this in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 4 is the crux of his argument. You got to hear this. It says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. That is, animals. Dumb animals at that could not take away the sins of people. But it was the will of God that sins be atoned for. See, that's the problem. Blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, but it was the will of God that sins be atoned for. So now we got a problem. See, even though the law offered bulls and goats, the writer says they were not efficient for the job. But the job still had to be done. So we got a problem. We have a, we have a, a quandary. Are you, are you following me? All that the sacrifices of animals could do was that they reminded man of his uncurable, sinful condition. And that he had a barrier, that there was a barrier between him and God. The Hebrew writer said in verse 1, says, For the law, having a shadow, praise the Lord, of the good things to come, and not the very image of those things. The law uh, was a foreshadow of what God had in mind, but it was not the very image, look at this, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therein to perfect. Year after year they offered the sacrifices, but they could not make the people clean. For where for then would they, if they would have worked, verse 2 says, for then would they not have, would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But they couldn't, it didn't work. Are you following me? But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. In other words, every time they went, it reminded them of how wicked they were. People have to go uh, to the oncologist. Nobody likes going to the oncologist. You know if you're going to see an oncologist, you have a cancer problem. Nobody smiles going in there. And even if they tell you 
you're clean, uh, but they give you a date to come back and get checked. When that date comes, you still aren't happy about walking in there because it is a reminder of what you had and how it can reoccur. So when they went every year, it only reminded them of their sinful condition, but it couldn't do anything to cure the condition. But that was still a problem. God the Father wanted the condition cured. His just and righteous demands demanded that something be done about our sins. That is what the writer of Psalms 40 and verse 6 prophesied about. He foretold that there would come a day. He said, 40 and verse 6, sacrifices and offerings thou didst not desire. Mine ear hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. And the volume of the book is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God. Now I want to point out something here before we take this home. If you say amen, I'll speed up. <laughs> if you notice in Psalms 40 and verse 6, he says, Mine ear has thy open. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5c, he says, But a body hast thou prepared me. Now the question is, was it an ear or was it a body? You don't hear me. Psalms 40 and verse 6 was written in Hebrew. And in the Hebrew text, it says an ear. Better, thou hast given me an open ear. That is, you have touched me with, uh, with uh, you have touched me and with everything I hear, I will obey. So you've given me an ear to hear and do Everything that you said do. But in uh, 270 B.C., by that time, the world had been Hellenized. And more people spoke Greek than they spoke Hebrew. So the task was to translate and transliterate the Hebrew text into the Greek language. And so in Alexandria, Egypt, they began this task. So in the Septuagint, or the Septuagint, where, however, however you choose to pronounce it, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It is the Hebrew of the Old Testament translated into Greek writings. And in the Greek, it translates, a body hast thou prepared me which literally means you created me a body and with my body I shall do your will. The Hebrew, you gave me an ear to hear and obey to do your will. So in essence, they mean the same thing. Best way I can describe it to you is if I was in a car and I was in an accident and my car was on fire, and I couldn't free myself. And my son-in-law saw me. And John reached his hand in. And I grabbed his hand. And he pulled me out. I would be right to say that thank God that God gave John a strong hand. But also, when I had the accident, uh, he was the only one who could hear my cry as I was in the car crying out for help. He heard me and came down and pulled me out. I would also be right if I would say, John, you had a tremendous ear to hear what I said. Both statements are accurate. He heard me and he reached for me. God gave Jesus an ear to hear the will of God. God gave Jesus a body 
to come down and to do the will of God with. What was the will of God? The will of God was for a worthy sacrifice to be given to take away our sins. Verse 6 says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hadst no pleasure. Billions of, of offerings had been given. Rams, lambs, goats, oxen, all of these in the Old Testament had died and died and died and died. All of that bloodshed and man was as sinful as he was before the first sacrifice. Oh my. So now we have a problem. Bring me up here because we're getting ready to go home. We have a sacrificial system that is totally insufficient. And men were doing, going by the system because it was the only system that we had. So then verse 7 says, then said I. What's interesting is then doesn't mean at that time. But then means in that situation. Praise are in those circumstances. See, we have a problem and we have a system. But the system doesn't address the problem. We need another system to address the problem. Because the solution is not working. I want to tell you who I've been seeing today, you need to get another solution. Because sin will never satisfy you. The devil is your enemy. He's not your friend. You got to come up with another solution. And I know what the solution is. When we were left with that situation, the Bible tells us, then Jesus spoke up. Verse 7 says, then said I. That's Jesus talking. Jesus said, I. Lo, I come. Now, what is, the, what is uh, the emphasis here when Jesus spoke up? First of all, verse 7 uh, assumes his preexistence. This gives us a, a conversation of what happened in heaven. Jesus spoke up and said to the Father, Lo, I come. What's the difference here? Now, we're not dealing with a dumb animal. All of those animals who were sacrificed, none of them are voluntarily sacrificed. None of them knew that they were going to be sacrificed. The Bible said the sheep before the slaughter and before his shearers are dumb. He can, can be next in line to get his head cut off and still not know that he's getting ready to die. So those sacrifices were sacrifices of dumb animals. Now we have a sacrifice of somebody who is intelligent, articulate, knowledgeable, aware, amen, and purposeful. He said, I come. I know what I'm doing. You know, as awesome as the sacrifice uh, that was made by Dr. King was, King didn't give his life. They took it. When he was standing out there on the terrace of the Lorraine Hotel, it had he known that the sniper was going to shoot him, he would have rightly stayed in the room. He had no idea that he was in danger. But we find Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. And when I go down there, they're going to grab me. They're going to mistreat me. They're going to handle me. They're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. He knew before he went what they were going to do to him. Do you not know, you know, we often say that we're born to die. But the truth is, we're not born to die. We're all born to live until we die. The only person who was born to die was Jesus Christ. He was born to die for the sins of the world. And we find him in his pre-existent state. In heaven saying to the Father, Lo, I come. Uh -huh, but he said something today, parenthetically, that I want to just stress just a little bit. 
Because if you don't read it right, then you think that God had to come up with a secondary plan. If you don't read it right, you think that God had to come up with a plan B. And I'm here to tell you that if the God of the Bible needed a plan B, then he's not perfect. See, because when you are perfect, you get it right the first time. So if God had to come up with a plan, then that means, hallelujah, that he didn't quite know what he was doing. And I want you to know that you serve a God who knows what he's doing. He's never at a loss. He's never caught off guard. The Bible teaches that he never sleeps and he never slumbers. He's so awesome that he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what shall be before it starts. He speaks the things that be not as though they were. He speaks of future events as though they happened in the past, have already happened. He's a mighty God. So when Jesus stepped out and said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Why did he say that in the volume of the book it is written of me? The reason he said it, you notice he didn't say in the volume of the book they shall write of me. He didn't say someday they're going to write about this. But he said it's already written. That means God had already laid out the plan. And when the time was right, Jesus stepped up and said, Now it's my turn to follow the road map that's already written about me. For when you read the volume of the book, you will see that the book prophesied about me. In the book, they said I would be born of a woman. Check. Born of a virgin. Check. That he would be cut off. Check. He was of the seed of Abraham. Of the tribe of Judah. Of the household of David. That he would be born in Bethlehem. Anointed by the Holy Ghost. Herald by the angel. That he would perform miracles. That he would, that he would cleanse the temple. Be rejected of the Jews. Die a humiliating death. But he would rise again from the dead. That he would ascend to heaven. Sit at the right hand of God. And that someday he would come again. Check. 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 He checked off every block. It was already written. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody ought to thank God for what Jesus did. And it came together one night. The Bible says, and there in the same country were shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory shined on them, and said, Be not afraid. And he said, I got good news for you. For unto this day, in the city of David, is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And here will be the sign. It was already written, you will find a babe laying in a manger, wrapped in swatting the clothes, swatting clothes, swallowing clothes, lying in a manger. Manger, isn't it wonderful that Jesus Christ stepped up and did what the Father said he would do. And it was already laid out. This is why every one of us ought to praise the Lord for what Jesus did when he came. He said in the volume of the book, it is written of me, I come to do your will. I come to die on the cross. I come to die. I come to be born of a virgin and I come to live a sinless life. I come to heal the sick. I come to raise the dead. I come to heal your body. I come to give you joy. I come to give you the Holy Ghost. 
I come to bring you out of every situation. I come to give you a second chance when you're going through. I come to open doors for you, to make ways for you. I delight to do thy will. Oh God, somebody praise him. Somebody magnify him because the Lord, ah, the Lord, he came, he did it, and he's coming again. Somebody praise him right now. Grab somebody by the hand and say, let's celebrate. Jesus, let's celebrate the Lord for all he's done, for every door that is opened, for every way that is made. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. God wrapped himself in flesh and he came down, hallelujah, put himself in a woman and was born in Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah, Lord, I'm glad today. Are you glad? Are you glad? If you're glad, say yes. If you're glad, give him glory. Oh Lord, celebrate him. Celebrate him. Celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate the Lord. Oh, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Oh, when you get home, when you get home on Tuesday, when they ask you, what did Santa Claus bring? Mm, you tell them about St. Nicholas. And then you go to the next level and tell them what I have. Jesus gave it to me. Thank you, Lord. How many are saved today? You can't be saved. You cannot be saved. And if you, and thinking right, and have a Christmas that's not merry. Because if you're thinking right, you have so many reasons to praise the Lord. What if you wake up on Christmas morning and you're sick in your body? You still have a reason to lift those sick hands and praise the Lord. What if you wake up and your money is funny and your change is strange? You still have a reason to lift your hand, broken all, and praise the Lord. Oh, ah, yeah, I have a reason. I have reasons. I have multiple reasons to praise the Lord. Yeah! Mm -hmm. He's been so good and he's been so kind. He said, I come to do thy will, O oh God. He came and he fixed it so that we so that we could be cleansed from sin. And notice this, Jesus died once. He did it once. Once and for all. He will never come and die on the cross again, ever ever 
No how, no way. You know the main reason? The main reason is it's not necessary. For what he did was sufficient in and of itself. And everybody here who is saved today and on your way to heaven owes Jesus praises for what he did. Hallelujah. Glory to God. was not forced. His arms, his hands was not twisted. Nobody made him do it. He volunteered. To for, remember when John got ready to uh, baptize him? And he said to John, uh, John said to him, I'm not worthy. You, you should be baptizing me. Jesus says, no. Suffer it to be so to fulfill all scripture. For in the volume, volume scrolls, in the depth of the book, the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. The New Testament points at Jesus. The epistles points back toward Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. So, now, here we are at Christmas time. A time of the year that was once set aside to celebrate his birth. Every believer, when you go home and you visit your loved ones, I don't care what church they're from, doesn't matter whether they go to church or not, you make sure that, so what we need to, Observe the true meaning of Christmas. No, we need to observe the meaning of Christmas. Because if it's the true meaning of it, then that means the rest of the meanings aren't real. So we take a minute. Okay, let's take a minute. That's what I tell you. Make sure you take a minute to reflect. What do you do with the rest of your time? Forget? If we're going to only take a minute to reflect, I guess the rest of the time is going to be into what? Drinking? Secular, carousing. Well, I don't wanna I don't wanna be a killjoy. I don't wanna spoil the celebration. If talking about Jesus spoils the, the celebration at Christmas time, what does that tell you about your celebration? You know why bringing up Jesus bothers people at this time? Because when you bring him up, you got to do something with him. You have to either accept him or reject him. And those who outright reject him don't want to talk about it. They want to control the dialogue and talk about what they want to talk about. And, and in the name of being peacekeepers, down through the years, all the saints have done is take down, be quiet, be silent, and now you can't hardly find a store that will even display Merry Christmas. And with them not even displaying Merry Christmas, and we're flat out... Uh, Deny, I will tell you they're not going to do it. They can still get our money. Shame on us. They, cause, cause we want our children to be happy. Your children, your children didn't, didn't. Uh, uh, the volume of the book ain't written about them. That's right. That's right. The volume of the book is not written about your mother. The volume of the book is not about me. The volume of the book is about Jesus and what Jesus did. As we capitulate, we are being robbed of our religion. We're being robbed of our religious beliefs. 
We don't want to bring up the resurrection at Easter. That's going to be an argument. But I'll tell you what. Wait till the next person send me a note about their birthday. I, whoever you are, I'm going to use you. Because it's going to be about everything but you. We're going to dance all around you. But we're not going to recognize you. See how you feel about that. Because notice now, we'll go along with that. And we live in a day now where we want recognition for everything. For ourselves. We can go through death and have lost a family member so far down the line, we didn't know we had them. You forgot the person's name, but you, on Sunday morning, though, you want your name called. See how, see how it is? But when it comes down to the things of the Lord, see, you know, only Pastor Wooden would. Oh, I, it's always my task to just. Tell it like it is. Always my time. Do you see what's happening? He took away the first covenant. Those first sacrifices. And he established the second. And the second was established once and for all. I want to pray uh, a prayer, and our time is up uh, today. <clears throat> for those who would want to rededicate their lives to Jesus, and the rededication, I'm not talking about backsliders, those who backslid and left Jesus, and most certainly I'm not leaving you out. But for that believer who feels the need to get closer to him, for that person who feels, you know, preacher, you know you're saying something because you're right. There is a drifting. And I find myself, I ain't going back to drinking or anything like that, but I, I don't love him like I did before. I don't, that first love. It's hard to admit that. My excitement for the things of God are not what they were before. And uh, I feel some things. And I want to, as this year closes out, Last sermon that I hear my pastor preach live this year. I want to rededicate and get closer to Jesus Christ. And when we leave here today, we want to leave here celebrating him. That preacher, that missionary, that father, that mother, that son, that daughter, that individual, who says, I want to get closer. I feel the need. I want St. Nicholas's zeal. I'm not saying go hit anybody, but to be zealous like that, come to the altar, and I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that God would touch you again. Hallelujah. Sometimes the effects of life can pull you, pull you away. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to be closer. I want my zeal. I want to celebrate the Lord. I think a lot of things that have happened in society is due to our willingness to just tolerate. They messed us up when the softies got hold to the scripture. Speak the truth in love. 
Now, the main uh, emotion or characteristic, characteristic that we display is passivity. We just take it. You know why Hollywood won't make movies criticizing Allah? The Muslims won't take it. Not only, not only will we take it, we go. What would happen? Said it once, I'll say it again. What would happen if just one year, not everybody, just the Christians, said to the merchants, you came acknowledge Jesus at Christmas time. We don't want you to acknowledge him at the 4th of July. We're not saying that you got to have it up for Thanksgiving. But since it is Christmas, since it is Christmas, you know, it would take, you know, it would take an act of law for it not to be Christmas. But that's in the books. That's the law. That's the federal government. That's law. You have to, you got to go through you got to change the law. Can't just decide, uh, uh, a president can't just say, it ain't Christmas no more. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's settled. Uh, and it's the only one that the government recognizes in this month. Wouldn't it be something if the saints would just say, if you won't do that, you can't have my money. All, oh, Vicky, just one time. Just one year. One year, but you know and I know that that's not going to happen because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that much to us. How else do you explain it? I think about these things. As we come home with our treasures, I wonder if Jesus is smiling. How about it, wife? Would you be smiling? Thinking about your husband coming home with treasures from uh, another woman? And, uh, and she wouldn't even acknowledge you. Wouldn't even call your name. And he's excited about the pie she gave him. Would you eat it? Would you want it? Could you receive that? Look at it. It's the best pie ever. Can't nobody bake pies like she can. But she won't even speak to you. Would you want it? Some of these people, you say Merry Christmas to them, you catch them off guard. The merchants, oh, oh, and then they whisper, Merry Christmas. We, 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 I feel the same way you feel, but I just don't want to offend anybody. And they get our money. Yeah. You have, you have to kind of say shame on us, right? I mean, to be honest, right? Just being honest now. Just being honest. Just being honest. Jesus checked off all those things for us. There's a store that I like to shop at over at North Hills. First thing you see on the door is Merry Christmas. If I ever go there and it's not, I'm asking, now what's going on? What's, what happened? Well, we decided to go in another direction. See ya. I came with a handful of money, but you ain't getting it. Wouldn't that be something? If everybody did it, Joy, just one time. Just one time. We would never have to worry about this thing again. Them, them babies doing all that crying while our preacher would be grown before we have to fight this battle again. If ever. 
Lord, we come before you feeling somewhat like the church at Ephesus who loved you, that church, the people loved you. But you said to them, I have one ought against you. I admire, I have many areas of commendation, but I have one ought against you. And my ought is that you don't love me like you used to love me. My art is not that you don't love me because you do love me, but you don't love me like you used to love me. And I want you to love me like you used to love me. Huh? Because I love you like I used to love you. I love you today like I loved you when I made you. I love you today like I loved you when I died for you. I love you today like I loved you when I was wrapped in flesh and came down and experienced life as a human being while at the same time being God. I loved you I love you now as I loved you then. That's why, that's the reason that the sacrifice that I made back then, 2019 years ago, is as effective in curing you and washing away your sins today as it was back then. Yeah. People who got saved in the first century. Their salvation was not fresher than the people who get saved today is. It's the same salvation. Because I love you as much now as I did then. But you don't love me now like you did a few years ago. So, Father, we come. We come, Lord, declaring our love for you. We come, Lord, with a mind to set the record straight. We come, O oh God, with a mind to lovingly place you in the highest place of sanctification in our hearts. Your word says that we're to sanctify the Lord Jesus in our hearts. Lord, we sanctify you in our heart. We place you first. Mm. We lift you up above everyone and everything else. We put you in your place of prominence. We exalt you. We recommit to you. We recommit to celebrating you. We recommit to being thankful. We recommit to giving you glory <clears throat> for all the things that you have done. We recommit, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, bless us that we draw nearer to you, closer to you. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen.